What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Blurred It Out. Now, today we're going to be talking about the live action One Piece because the manga's on break. But before we get into that, I'd like to address the, the recent news about Akira Toriyama. So it was announced, I believe, yesterday that Toriyama passed on March 1st at 68 years old. And if you don't know who Akira Toriyama is, uh, he's the creator of Dragon Ball, and he's been a part of many other influential works like Chrono Trigger, Blue Dragon. You know, he's been a part of the the wider scope of the anime and manga community and even gaming for a long time. And so the the anime community and I mean a huge portion of the world in general is affected by his passing. I mean if you if you know any kind of a, a media, you know, that has to do with like not just anime and manga, but even, you know, the the way it shaped western culture you know that toriyama was such an influential figure and as a person who didn't necessarily you know watch or indulge in a lot of dragon ball i still recognize the the impact that it has on you know like for example the one piece world but the the world this this community that i'm in as general you know you look at cartoons from our, our youth and you can see the influence that even Dragon Ball has there like I, I think about Cartoon Network and how so many shows there had like references to, to Dragon Ball uh, th the first one that comes to mind is always number four from Codename Kids Next Door basically transforming and his hair just gets way bigger and that's his transformation but the that there even the idea of like transformations the, the power-ups the super saiyan the all of that it stems from dragon ball when you think about anime tropes you go back to dragon ball you have the spirit bomb you have the next time on x you have kamehameha you know this this idea of this you know battle shonen really stems back to dragon ball and I, i'm sure people can you know the test like okay it's a cartoon or it's an anime things like that there are all these people like that but when you look at what Toriyama has done and how insane the influence is you know you can't help but just feel the loss and it's it's a time for mourning and it's a time for recognition because we we wouldn't have all the things we have now without Toriyama you know so many mangakas have reference Toriyama as their influence as their that was what made them basically create and this this reminds me a lot of how I felt when Takahashi passed because you know these are decades of life that have been put into this passion and they've affected so much of my life and so many other lives like without Without these people here, you know, these videos wouldn't exist. You know, these communities that we see on on YouTube, on Twitter, all this kind of stuff just wouldn't exist. And so obviously rest in peace, but you know, I, I thank Toriyama for creating this world in which I feel so a part of and accustomed to. And I, I actually recorded the episode before the news broke out, so this is gonna be like added to the episode, but I did I did want to add this because I wanted this to be a part of it. So without further ado, let's discuss the live action. And this is off the heels of watching the Avatar live action, which I somehow watched before the One Piece live action. Before we get to the breakdown, let's hear a word from our sponsors. You are now listening to the Blur Out podcast, which is available on your favorite podcast websites like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and more. Check the link in the description or search Blur It Out wherever you podcast and you will find greatness. Episodes are also uploaded on my main YouTube channel at Tyrant King Kuma and on the official podcast YouTube channel at Blur It Out Podcast. Okay, as always, if you haven't watched the entirety of the live action, there will be spoilers ahead. <laughs> Oops! Spoilers. Now I'm going to break this down into the good and the bad because I think there's definitely enough to talk about in both areas. Now for me, it was overwhelmingly good. I really enjoyed the time I had with the One Piece live action. From the, the casting, the set design, the music, just the, the effects, all of it I think was really well done. 
there are a few things here and there I think that can be nitpicked on or like kind of pointed out because you know there's some things that don't translate well to live action everything's not going to be a one-to-one -one and it's not going to come out perfectly so let's dive into the bad first i want to hit that first kind of get that out the way so i can just gush about the good stuff now one of the biggest things that kind of caught my eye when watching this series was the the way the effects were done and for the most part i thought they were done really well buggy when they did Buggy's Chop Chop Fruit effects, I think those were always clean and crisp. Like, they just felt right. Luffy, on the other hand, sometimes it felt a little off. And this is to be expected. Like, I think Luffy's ability in general just doesn't look right in live action. Even more so than like a, a Mr. Fantastic because it's not... The way Luffy's ability works is it's not just stretching. He has to, like, initiate the stretch. So he has to wind his arm back and then throw it out. You know, he doesn't just stretch immediately all the time. And not to say that it looked bad every time he did it. There were just some scenes where it kind of just... It didn't look as clean as I think it could have. And honestly, I think a lot... Not a lot. I know that there are a few complaints that I would have that kind of revolve around Luffy as a character. And while some of it was based on the, the effects of the fruit, other parts were just how Luffy kind of portrays himself in the series. Because I get what they were going for. A very free, fun-loving, just childlike wonder Luffy. And while that does match Luffy's style in the, the original, it, it's one of those things where the one-to-one -one just doesn't it doesn't transfer that well. Like, Luffy is almost too goofy in the live action. And maybe goofy isn't the right word for it, but it's like, uh, it, it feels like every scene has Luffy just being like the blissfully unaware, just happy all the time kind of character. And Luffy isn't really like that. Like, he he's more nuanced than that. So to see almost every situation, Luffy's just kind of like, yeah, okay. <laughs> it it doesn't feel as good. And it's not even to say that I want him to be like the opposite of Goofy. Like I want him to be more serious and brooding. I kind of just want him to be normal. Like just casual. Not happy, not sad, just existing sometimes. Because sometimes Luffy just vibes. Like he's not always, you know, in a great mood, in a bad mood. Sometimes he's just chilling. Another character that I think kind of suffers from being too much in a certain wheelhouse is Garp. I think Garp actually is on the opposite side of that, where he's too serious most of the time. And now for Garp, I think that plays more into how the series introduces him as a character early on, as somewhat of an antagonist for Luffy in the East Blue, which isn't normally how it's done, but you know, this is... Uh, a new version of Garp's story. But Garp is very serious and straightforward. Like, they give him moments of goofiness or, like, non-serious Garp. But for the most part, he's just serious, straight-to-business type character. And while Garp has his moments of seriousness in the original, he is very free and fun-loving like Luffy. So, like, you would almost want them to bring Luffy down a bit, bring Garp up a bit, and meet them in the middle, especially because they're related. You know, they're supposed to be very similar. But in the show, their similarity is kind of showed by their their love of meat, and that's kind of the, the most depth you get out of it. Otherwise, they just seem like polar characters. Almost like foils. Surprisingly enough, they avoid a lot of cringe acting, in my opinion. I think a lot of it comes off well. There's certain scenes that can be a little much. Like Zoro's I Will Never Lose Again scene is kind of... It doesn't quite hit the way it should. It, it feels a little too acted, I guess. And some of Luffy's dialogue comes off as a little cringe, but I, I kind of note that more to the one-on-one, -on -one, you know bringing Luffy to live action more than just the writings off. Because I think the writing was fine. 
I think that the direction was fine. It's just they were trying to match it up a little too much sometimes. And that ends up setting it apart, especially when the rest of the series is kind of separate. Um, as far as like design goes, honestly, most of it was just fine. I, I don't love the Mary Sheep's Head. I just don't. Which, I don't know. I feel like it's one of those things where they... They could have stuck to a more manga anime look to it. Like, there was no real reason for it to be a realistic sheep's head. No, I'm not opposed to it. I just don't like it as much. It just makes the Mary seem somewhat off-putting. Um, some of the fight scenes looked a little eh. And honestly, that's... I include it in the bad only because it's noticeable, not because it's like overwhelmingly disgusting. Like, because the fight scenes in general are really good. Sometimes the the choreography catches up with them and it looks just a little off where you kind of see where they have to like improvise some things to make it look more like the anime. But overall, overall good. Just sometimes, you know, it catches your eye. It pulls you out a little bit. And honestly, that's that's really all the bad like the one other thing i'll say that doesn't quite fit is the garp interaction with mihawk because garp really wouldn't call on pirates for help that's a very not garp thing to do but again they're building garp as a different type of character here so i i would give that a pass but we got all the bad stuff out of the way Let's talk about the good, because there's so much good in this adaptation. And you can tell that Oda and Matt really went in on making this not just like a an adaptation, not just like a live action of an anime, but something the fans could enjoy, something new fans or new watchers could become fans too. And like the let's start off with the casting. The casting is amazing. I think they cast everyone pretty on point. I don't think there was anyone who was like, nah, this doesn't fit. Like everyone felt like their character. And even to a degree, everyone like looked like their character. Like obviously there's gonna be there there were some differences in in the way characters were portrayed as far as like casting goes, but I think I appreciate all those as well. Because it added it added a new feel to it. Like the the change to Shanks' crew with Lucky Roo. Like, I think that, I like that change a lot. As soon as I saw that, I was like, oh, yeah, that's fantastic. Um, The change to Nojiko, I also like that. I like that the, the crew itself is diverse. You know, not, it's it's one thing that, you know, it's, it's anime, you know, there's not going to be a huge amount of diversity in the cast that's built. And when you got to think about it, it's, it's an animated world, it's fiction, you know, it's not real. So... The races that we see and live with every day aren't going to match up to anime. So when you bring that into live action, that gives you the chance to really change things up. Because it doesn't it doesn't really alter the story. It just enhances it. So I think those changes were on point, perfect, loved them. My favorite casting, It's it's got to be between Emily Rudd and Jeff Ward. So... Emily Rudd is Nami, Jeff Ward is Buggy. Those two are probably my favorite cast of characters in the entirety of the show. I I loved all their interactions, all their scenes, everything about those two characters was just done so well. And special shout out to Buggy, because the way Jeff Ward does Buggy, the way Buggy is written in this show is absolutely fantastic. Like, this makes me like Buggy more than I actually do in, like, the anime and manga. It's such a... It's a combination of, like, Buggy from the series, but also you get a stronger hint of Joker. Like a Joaquin Phoenix, Heath Ledger kind of Joker thrown in there. And it works so well. And that's one of the things I liked about Buggy initially. Like, even back to the, the four kids dub. There was always this air that Buggy was menacing, yet, you know, he had this, this goofy clown side to him, but he's also menacing. 
like he was a legit scary clown pirate. He wasn't just a joke. And in this show, like he's he's a legit scary clown pirate. And he still has the humor. Like he has a lot of humor to him. And we'll get we'll talk about the humor of the show because that's also another thing. But he has so much humor in his scenes. And it's like it's deadpan humor, it's intentional humor, it's you know, slapstick, it's intentionally like him making a bad joke and it just fitting the moment. Like there's a scene where he he's got his head trapped in a bag and the crew's yelling at him and he Sanji's holding him so he talks to Sanji and says, What are you gonna do? Make me a souffle? Like it's just it's things like that. Nice little touches and like Buggy is just unfettered by anything that's happening around him. He's just going with the flow, being Buggy. I I really love the fact that they include him throughout the series or like throughout the the season I should say because they they could have just left him after his arc ends basically after he gets bazooka out of here they could have just left him behind and buggy does come back in later but not as soon as they do it with the, the live action here they bring him back in Arlington Park and it's it's awesome it's fantastic and they even allude to him and Alvita working together so he's going to be Probably one of the mainstays, even more so than in the manga. Because Buggy comes back periodically. Every once in a while, he'll come back and be like, oh yeah, Buggy. But here, I feel like he's going to be more prominent, like potentially being a part of every season. And then to Nami, Emily Rudd. She nails this role and then some. She actually gives some depth to Nami that I, I think... I would like to see in the actual manga and that not even like an exaggeration like just the way that nami interacts with the crew here interacts with the people it's it it's weird because it feels like nami but it's not the kind of nami we usually see you know i would like nami to get like there's just like a, a sarcastic kind of dryness to some of her wit that i would like to see more like sometimes she's just fed up with everybody and we, we we see that all the time like the manga where she's like you know she punches Lupi in the head or she's yelling at someone but there is something about the sarcastic element of it that I think really fits Nami's character like if you were to take away just the the her being mad and you know put some passive aggressiveness or like some just one shot she's upset but she's just staring at Luffy not saying anything not doing anything just mad like those kinds of things really do well for Nami's character the way she interacts with the rest of the crew is fantastic like her own story is great I mean they they really did well with not only writing her character but choosing her to play it because she was able to portray Nami in a light I think it would have been difficult to do and despite Nami not being as some would say complex in like the the main series I think the complexities lie in the background. Whereas just because we don't see them don't mean they necessarily don't exist. I think Nami has a lot of potential to be complex. And while we get hints and pieces of what goes through her mind, how she acts and stuff, I think the live action does a good job of bringing more personality to her character. And those are just like the, the best castings. I think overall the casting for, for each and every character was done well. Uh... I would also say like Zoro, Sanji, Luffy, Usopp. The the entire crew is is casted perfectly, I think. Um I haven't seen enough of Shanks to really get the feel for him, to be honest. I think that one's I don't think it's bad. I just I don't know. I don't I don't feel the Shanks as much as I feel other characters. Like Mihawk feels very Mihawk. It's like some some of these characters play into their role a bit more than others you have you have the characters that lean heavily into it like Luffy you have characters that just match it like Mihawk and then you have characters that are kind of just playing it like Shanks all still doing really good it's just there's different levels to how it's portrayed we get Bogard and we get like actual scenes with Bogard you know we always see him kind of just chilling sitting next to Garp but to see him actually like I don't know, interact, be a character, that's really enjoyable. Especially because I know a lot of people like Bogard just as like a design-wise character. 
So I'm sure they were happy to see him actually, you know, have some roles. Uh, outside of casting, like, I, I actually, I, as I was watching, I wrote down certain things I liked about each episode. Because I wanted to, to highlight, like, the, the really cool stuff. One of the things that we we kind of get as Easter eggs for each episode is is outfits. The outfits, they they used, like, different color spreads. They used covers. They used a bunch of stuff to inspire the outfits for the crew. And they, they changed them every episode. So, like, we're used to seeing Luffy and the crew in one outfit for probably episodes and episodes and episodes on end but here we get like such a a colorful change through all the outfits that you know could be couldn't be we get the originals we get things that they have never worn like in the series but on covers like there's there's the dinner party for kaya and they're they're getting dressed in like the the big closet and they end up wearing the outfits from Volume 6, which I believe is in Serb Village. I wonder, is that whom the bell tolls? Uh, no, Volume 6 is the old. But they have the outfits from Volume 6. And that cover is one of my favorites of all time. So when I saw them, like just Nami throws Zoro the gold shirt. And then when they actually show up, they have like the all black fitted on. It's so good. And I was so excited. As soon as I saw that, I was like, wait a minute. I know the outfit. It's like, I, I love this cover so much. So when I saw those outfits, that's what kind of initially gave me the, the hint that they were using a bunch of different outfits from covers and stuff. And I looked it up and yeah, they use all kinds of inspirations for the outfits. And they have like other Easter eggs, more like in the line of... So they have like Easter eggs and they have subtle changes. Um, one of the things I noticed that was a really big Easter egg for me at least, when Luffy first eats the, the fruit, gum gum fruit, he gets it out of a box that has a marine emblem on it. Now, if you're fully caught up in the series, you know that Shanks stole the fruit from the marines, but that's not something we know until much, much later in the series. We didn't find that out until Wano, I believe. So the fact that they kind of, they hint at it here, and they don't draw attention to it. It's, it's a very blink and you'll miss it type scene. But when Luffy is just like opening the box, you see like the, the marine emblem on top of it. I was like, that's such a good... When they showed that, I was watching with someone else. And, like, not all of them have seen One Piece. So they're kind of, like, watching us first-timers. Uh, so when I watched it, I saw the emblem, and I had them rewind. I was like, wait a minute. There's no way they just did that. I was like, oh, that's a really good touch. I like that. And, I mean, they make, like I said, subtle changes throughout the series to breathe freshness into it without exactly changing it. Like, one of the things when I mentioned earlier, Buggy... Buggy shows up more in the, the season than he does in the actual manga. Buggy's there for Arlong Park, which he is not, obviously. They have Garp interacting with Mihawk, which is another thing that doesn't happen. And Garp in general being, like, not only at Gold Rogers' execution, but being a main in the first season, following Luffy through East Blue. They have... They have Baroque works early in. So... There's there's a scene in the manga where Zoro talks to Baroque Works and he mentions that they tried to recruit him, but he obviously denied it. They actually include that scene as like an introductory to Zoro's character, which is really great. They end up making Nojiko and the rest of Nami's village not know that Nami was working to buy the village back. And I mean, in the in the series proper, they don't necessarily know they catch on like they figure out what's going on but they just don't tell her but in in the live action here they outright don't like nami like they hate nami whenever she shows up they literally hate her even nojiko hates her and it's not until they figure out that it's like okay our, our hate was misplaced like instead of nami stealing the ship she actually gets taken to arlong park by arlong himself arlong comes to baratie and takes nami back with him instead of Nami sailing there herself. I mean, it's just, just changes like that, that they breathe new life into the show and they don't really mess up the story. The story does not feel broken, really. Like, obviously, we're not going to get some events down the road. Like, we're not going to get the Garp reveal in Water 7 because it's already happened. 
We're not going to get the, the Kobe Luffy meetup because that's already happened. Well, we might still get that. That might be coded differently, but you know, there, there's some things we don't get. And it's not necessarily bad because, you know, we're we're telling a, a different version of the story. It doesn't have to be exactly as Oda wrote it because Oda already proved this anyway. So and like more specifically to the episodes. Ah, right. And so in Buggy's episode, they they do a lot more. Like I was saying how they portrayed Buggy, they do a lot more to make Buggy menacing. And that includes like having the captive audience as as a crowd for his big top. So normally he was kind of just chilling on rooftops and he had his crew up there. They were hanging out. But here he has like all of the civilians chained up in his big top. And he has them as like captive audience members. And he has like signs where it's like laugh, quiet, things like that. You know, like the generic audience signs. But it's like, if you don't do it, you die. That was such a good touch for Buggy because it it just gives him that menacing edge that he needs. They gave Kabaji lore in the Zoro ended up killing Kabaji's brother. And that's kind of why there's a, a vendetta set. And this is the episode that really establishes Buggy as a, a solid character because they not only do they nail his his acting, they they nail the fruit in the way it looks. Like of all the effects I think they do in the show, Buggy's fruit is like top tier. It looks really good. To the point where it feels like they spent a lot of time on making Buggy look right. And not necessarily on Luffy's. Not saying that Luffy's was bad, but Buggy's outshines his completely. And interesting enough about Dove Roots, they have Makino kind of explain to Luffy in, in the flashback what, what Dove Roots are and how they work. Which I thought was a nice touch. They give Makino a bit more like interesting characterization instead of just being like this this background character that shows up says a few words disappears she like has more of a role in the the world building i especially like when bug is kind of showcasing his power and he he does the trick where he has a a bomb in his hand like a, a sleeping gas bomb but he's like showcasing his power he's moving his limbs around and then he looks towards his arm and his hand's not there. And it turns out his hand's floating behind Luffy, pops the bomb next to him, punches him in the head, and knocks him out. That was so good. Just, oh, I just, I, I love so much how he did Buggy. I can't stop telling you how much I love Buggy. One of the things that I actually ended up writing for multiple episodes was the interactions between Zoro and Nami. Because they did a really good job of making these two create a bond and make it so realistic that, you know, when they're actually going to save Nami, it feels like they care a lot more. Because Zoro is always the character that, you know, he is very cold, especially to new members until he's like, all right, we can trust you. You know, we saw it, we saw it, especially with Robin, how, how he kind of felt about that kind of stuff. So for these two to kind of bond, and it's, it's funny because they bond over, you know, they bond over trauma. They bond over experience. They bond over both kind of being roped into Luffy's whole crew idea. And they they create a stronger bond, I think, than anyone else in the show. Like, even between, like, Luffy and Zoro, Luffy and Nami. Zoro and Nami, I think, have the strongest bond in the show so far. And, like, it, it shows in each episode that they care for each other. It even leads up to that point where when when Zoro wants to go fight Mihawk and Nami's trying to stop him. And she's like, you're you're my friend. I don't want you to get hurt. And, you know, that brings up the whole ordeal with, oh, I thought you didn't have friends and that and the other. But you can you, you feel like the, the hurt in Nami when he says that. And then it comes back where she's he's going to leave like she's going to steal the ship and, and go to Arlong Park. But she stays to watch the fight with Zoro and Mihawk. And she's watching and she's like super concerned. Like she's holding Usopp's hand because she's worried. And then after Zoro loses, 
she goes into a, a different kind of upset with Luffy. Like, absolutely livid that Luffy would allow Zoro to do that in a case that could cost him his life. And actually, a, a cute touch they added was while, while Zoro was unconscious, they had Nami reading the story of Mountain Black Noland, which I thought was such a good touch. But also, Nami reading a story to Zoro while he's like knocked out unconscious, that's such a strong Zoro Nami moment. Like that, they just, they did that relationship really well. And it's something that doesn't exist as much in the manga. You know, we always talk about how we want more crew interaction. We want more of that. I think stuff like that right there is what we're looking for. Because personally for me, I think that Luffy, Zoro, and Nami have the strongest bond in the crew, like in the in the manga. And I would love to see that shown a lot more than it is. It's similar to how it's done here. And I think it's these changes, like just not only in how the story progresses, but how the characters just fundamentally are, that keeps the series from being flat. Because and I'll, I'll make the comparison to Avatar, which if you don't know exactly how I feel about Avatar, you can check it out on the, the previous episode, but it was bad. From the, the only thing I really liked, there were two things I liked about Avatar. That was the casting and that was the, the CGI effects. Everything else was garbage. The, the thing about these two is that, so with One Piece, they made changes, but they made changes that created a new story in the same world. So sure, things are happening differently, but you're going in the same direction. With Avatar, they made changes that just cut apart the story. And you, you didn't feel like you were getting to the end. You just felt like you were bouncing around these different events. And then the show ended. The, the casting in, in Avatar was great. The story behind the cast is abysmal. Like in One Piece, you have all these characters that are acting their part and then some. So you, you feel like these are the characters. Like... I don't know, I don't feel like I want someone else to play anybody in One Piece because I feel like everyone right now is doing a great job. In, in Avatar, I love the casting, but it's like, if something had to be changed to make it better, I feel like there's a possibility. I feel like you get another Boomy. I think Sokka was fine. I, I'm honestly not attached to Aang or Katara. I think you could replace them and it'd be fine. I think they could stay and it'd be fine. Like there's, it's the thing, I'm not attached to every character in Avatar like I was in One Piece. One Piece, I was enthralled with their characters. I mean, you have a strong story that's not even the original. It's just a good creation from the original. You have a strong cast. It's written properly. It's acted phenomenally. Like, I mean, it, of course, it's going to have its flaws. There, There's never going to be a perfect one-to-one, -one, especially going from live action to, or from going manga to live action. Never going to happen. But for what we got out of this, I think this is probably one of the best adaptations in this genre. Bar, like, I don't know, none. This is easily top three. I haven't seen every single one to know which ones are, like, the best best. But from ones I've seen, from ones I've heard about, this one right here is it. And last but not least, I do have to mention the humor. Because the humor in the live action was phenomenal. One, Buggy. Again, I will praise Buggy because Buggy was doing some heavy lifting in the show. The, the comedy from Buggy is fantastic. But the, the characters in general, like, they're, they're just naturally funny. Like, Zoro being a dead pin snorker the whole time. There's a, there's a time where Luffy's talking about Shanks. I think it's right before they meet Buggy. Uh, Luffy's talking about Shanks. And Zoro looks at Luffy like, who's Shanks? But Luffy just looks back at him with, like, just a scowl on his face. Doesn't say anything. He's just staring at Zoro like, what do you mean, who's Shanks? That that caught me off guard. There's the time where Luffy's at Bratier talking to Zeph. And Zeph is like, boy, I don't think you understand how this check works. And so Luffy puts his hand together and is like, nah, I don't think you understand how this check works. 
I was like, the, the part that I think killed me the most was Sanji's flashback where <laughs> Zeph was storming the ship and he, he runs into the soup and he tastes it and he's like, oh no, this is garbage. And he's about to put some oregano in it and then little baby Sanji comes out from the corner shouting oregano is for savages <laughs> and just attacks Zeph. Gets like mopped easily, but it's just, it's the vitriol and anger in Sanji's voice talking about oregano's for savages then attacking this scary pirate who's coming to kill everybody just the the entirety of that scene is just hilarious until immediately after when he gets really sad but before that absolute comedy and I mean the the show is filled like comedic moments like that like you'll have a good laugh on the show and that's one of the the true hearts of one piece is that there's just times where something will happen like in the background in the foreground and it's just you gotta pause and laugh at it because it's just one piece humor at its finest i think off the top of my head i think about the time where luffy has like that it's like a long pickler cucumber and he's talking to nami and robin's like yeah i got it from long ring island and then like a couple of seconds back he's like you can't have any and then nami starts saying like i didn't want it or the time where like they're in punk hazard and I forget who's talking, but you're looking at Luffy, Sanji, and Nami. And Nami is just like slowly raising a piece of meat to Luffy's face. And then Luffy eats it and Sanji smacks him in the back of the head. Like it's just really stupid comedic stuff like that that I think they capture in the show as well. Like all in all, I think this is a really solid adaptation. I would give it, I'll probably give it a solid 8 out of 10. I think there are still things that can be improved. And I think with the, the next season, they have that opportunity to do so. But for a start, this is really good. Solid 8 out of 10. If you have not seen it, check it out. Whether you've seen the original, like whether you've watched, whether you've read One Piece, check out the live action. It's good. It's fun. It's a great time. If you have seen it, let me know what you think. Did you like it? Did you hate it? I want to know. I will catch you in the next one.